Now, I'm going to cover gospel music, but I also want to kind of move into just Christian music in general because what's happening in gospel music is also happening with just regular contemporary Christian music. As a matter of fact, you're seeing more and more today a, a blurring of the lines. And I'm not going to act as though I am some expert on it. I'm not. Uh, I do have a little bit of, of, of musical ability in that I, you know, I play the drums. As a matter of fact, uh, I used to teach drums for a while. <clears throat> so I love music. I love drums. Uh, obviously, I love God. And one of the things that I used to be over at another church was just the overall worship portion of the service. So when you walked into the building, there was something going because you know how we are. Sometimes we are um, our attention can get different ways where so we might put the announcements up, uh, made sure that all the sound, and everything was working right. The the uh, the cameras and, and the screens and so forth. But just the overall worship experience was there, that there would be nothing that would take away from um, what God was doing. There'd be nothing that would take away from uh, the sermon, but also that there'd be nothing that would just kind of overshadow it. And sometimes you see that in music today, whether it be uh, gospel. And when I say gospel, I mean, obviously there's Southern gospel, but what we're talking about today happens to be more uh, what we would call black gospel, uh, soulful gospel contemporary Christian praise and worship, just regular old choir music, that kind of stuff. And so what's happening today, is it really what we ought to be doing? Now, let me say this before I go. There is no standard that the Bible puts out that says you have to sing it this way or this is the preferred style or method, that this is the right genre. We don't know. Uh, there will be singing in heaven. We just don't know what the genre is. And so I'm of the belief that I like to kind of have a little bit of all of it um, just so because some people have different preferences. And, and so my preference isn't better than yours. Yours isn't better than mine, but it's just a preference. But one of the things that uh, we know is that and you ask any church leader this, the if you want to find out where the good fights are, where the where the, uh, <laughs> the divisions are, where all the mess is, go to the choir. Because that, that's just, I don't know what it is about the choir. There just seems to be a lot of stuff happening. Maybe maybe it's because it's one of the arts and you can kind of get yourself kind of into it and you end up maybe want to express yourself and people's feelings get hurt. Who's going to lead this song? She can't sing that well. He can't play that well. All that kind of stuff like that. That happens in every other part of, of, of the ministry as well. And sometimes when you see the way the, the sausage is made, so to speak, in church, you might not like it, but again, it, these are human beings. But as it pertains to, to gospel music, a couple things you need to know about gospel music. And then, I, as I said, we're going to transition into just regular uh, overall Christian music as well, because some of the same things that trouble uh, this genre troubles others as well. When black folks came out of slavery, obviously, they're going to bring some things that they had handed down to them from their roots, some of the rhythmic sounds and so forth that came with them from Africa uh, and that was also brought into slavery and then you have these old spirituals that were sung in many cases in many cases they were sung to kind of lead people away if they were thinking about running if it was time for let's say tonight was going to be a good night to run they might they might sing the song sweet swing low sweet chariot um, or Michael Rowe the boat ashore just kind of let folks know hey this is happening tonight and so some of those old Negro spirituals were really masked as songs to help them get away. But then a lot of those songs were just songs to kind of keep them encouraged because it was a rough life being a slave. We don't we talk about how how uh, race relationships are today in America. No, uh, they didn't have a race relationships back then. It was just you were a slave and that was it. And so they would seem to kind of comfort themselves because what happened to them was they came to know Jesus by and large. And so they would speak about this. They would speak about, yeah, it's rough on this side, but when I get to that side, it'll be even better when I get to that great by and by. And so some of the songs that we sing today, that by and by, some of those songs were born out of a struggle, born out of a hurt, born out of a need. And when you sing in church, 
there should be a couple of things that are happening. We come together in church for uh, a lot of corporate things, corporate prayer, uh, corporate study, corporate fellowship, but also corporate praise and worship. And so it should come as no surprise because of all that was happening, of all that kind of transpired before the 19th century, before the 20th century, a lot of the struggle was built into some of these songs. And so in some of these songs, you would hear them talk about just the struggle, just the things about how, how God has kept me, how God has blessed me, right? Uh, the problem is, and, uh, and by the way, you would even see some of the emotional aspects. There is nothing wrong with a choir member or a singer or someone having emotion come out. Now, there are some people that have a preference where they want things to be kind of reserved and quiet. That's fine also. And there are times where folks just want to just, they just can't control themselves. If any of that is genuine, then amen. If any of it is manufactured, well, then we got a problem, right? Uh, because it should not be a place where you should go to show off how, how good your vocal skills are or how good you are on the piano or the drums or guitar. And that does happen, like with any band. Uh, bands can be messy. And, and let's remember, when you go to church and you hear the music, the guys that are playing, that's a band, though they're in church. And so there's a little bit of messiness going on right there. That's why a lot of good bands, think about when you were younger, even today, a lot of the good bands that were in, let's say, rock or R&B or what have you, they don't last because there's fighting. Same thing happens in the church because egos take over. And so you don't want the ego or you outshining who we're supposed to be putting on, on display, which is obviously God, which is Jesus. We come to magnify him. We come to praise him, but we also want to thank him. And so some of the songs in gospel tend to center around uh, what God has done for us or what he can do for us. My wife was the first person to kind of introduce me to uh, contemporary praise and worship music, what some folks would call that, you know, white music, right? Uh, some of the, the music where, what was the song? It was Casting Crowns, um, uh, I'm a Vapor in the Wind. I can't even, the, the, the song escaped me. One of you guys maybe can kind of tell me in the chats what this song, I cannot, um, I cannot remember the name of this song. But when I first heard the song, like, wow, that's just, where has this song been all my life or these kind of songs? And so I found myself going back, listening to some of these older songs that were 10 years old, five years old. And it's like, I didn't know these songs existed. I'm just stuck in this old gospel way, which is fine. The problem is that many of these songs, even after we've come out of the bigger struggle, they tend to be centered more about what I'm going through and God, you blessed me and how you kept me and so forth, uh, which are, which are good songs. That's fine. But we did not sing enough about songs that were about him. God, you're awesome. You're wonderful. Even if you don't bless me, God, you're, you're amazing. Those kind of songs. And so we see that in gospel, one of the problems that happens in gospel is partly because of the emotion. Again, some of these things, you'll see some of these same traits that you see in contemporary Christian music and just your regular old praise and worship music. Um, even in the, their the different genres, some folks are into this, like Christian rap and so forth. I really hadn't quite got into to Christian rap, although I'm not against it. There, there are a few artists that I do listen to, um, but I don't know, call it me getting old or whatever. I just don't listen to it uh, as much. But you'll see some of these same traits that are in gospel music that are also in the other genres because it's just human beings singing, hopefully to the praise of God. Well, as the emotions kick in, the question is, when this person is singing, are they singing more so much because they love God or because they're trying to show off? Uh, one of the things you'll know about black gospel music is that the runs are exaggerated and long. So you all know about if we just started singing Amazing Grace, we all at least know the first verse, right? But here we've got someone singing Amazing Grace, and this is just the first verse, and it takes quite a long time. Amazing Grace How sweet The sound that Oh, I, I once was, was, was 
was lost Oh, but now I am found Oh, and I was blind Oh, my God Right now Right now I can see that, that's part of the thing if you go to some of these black churches if you got somewhere to be immediately after church you might as well just not go just call and tell them you're not going to be there on time because it ain't going to happen um, that's part of the thing um, maybe that's why when I was I didn't go to church as a little boy maybe that's why I just hated being there for so long the preaching may have been about this long and the singing was this long we're going to sing for this much before and this much afterwards and so sometimes it is listen sometimes it's, it's genuine Sometimes, though, you wonder, man, are, are you guys doing this for you? Because, again, I know about what it's like playing in a band and you want to have fun. And it's OK if you are singing to enjoy yourself. You should enjoy yourself praising God. Praising God should not be a chore, but praising God should not be about you as well. And so the question that we often wonder and I've had times, I'm sure other people in ministry have had these occasions where, They've had to tell somebody, maybe a drummer, maybe a guitar player, maybe someone else, hey, listen, it's not about you. You want to settle down. So the question is, are these guys praising God? Or are they jamming? So that's kind of now, listen, I play the drums to, to stand and play the drums. That's hard. Now, the guy's talented. He's gifted. And maybe that's what he's trying to show off. And there is the, the, the little tension that a lot of choirs and churches have. Hey, listen, it's not about you. It's about him. And I get that you're talented. If you weren't talented, we wouldn't have you playing. But you're trying to. I never forget this one time. We have we had lighting at our church and we could even move the light. We could just you know, push a button, have the light aim a certain way. And we had a drummer come in who wanted to kind of fill in with the youth choir. And he asked, he said, uh, he said, can I have, can you get one of those lights to kind of shine on me? You know, as I'm, I got this particular role. And I said, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I got a light just for you. I'm gonna have a, one particular light shine on you, but I want you to sit your little narrow behind right there in that first pew. That's where you're going to be. And we'll have somebody else playing. I'll have a light shine on you because you just made it about you. We're not going to have that. Now, if he was smart, <laughs> if he was smart, he'd have kept his mouth closed. So, but we have that problem in church, right? And so you deal with it. But the problem is trying to kind of recapture really what it used to be uh, compared to what it is now. And I don't know how, how old some of you guys are and how how old you or how long you guys have been even watching or paying attention to, to Christian music and gospel music. Some things are different, obviously. I mean, obviously with time, you get more uh, amenities. I mean, we didn't have intelligent lighting in the 50s and 60s, right? You didn't have some of the microphones that you had. You didn't have some of the building designs, the lighting and so forth. You didn't have all that stuff that you had back then. You didn't have the, the in-ear mics and so forth um, that you had uh, that you have now back then. And so uh, the issue is, should we try to even compare how it was back then? Uh, or is it, should we be like we were back then? Should we be different because it's a different time but you all tell me you look at these two clips and tell me is there any sort of difference and then also if gospel is not your genre see if you see the same thing in other genres contemporary christian southern gospel what have you So now compare what you just saw with her and what you saw with those groups versus this. Hip, hip, 
Now, I am intentionally turning the volume down because I want you to look at this video and you tell me if you could you tell me that they are singing anything closely or remotely related to Jesus. Let me know if you think so. I don't think you can look at this and come away with the conclusion that they are singing unto God. I, it, what has happened is it has now become more of obviously a show. And so even in these wars, you've got the red carpet and you've got people who who come down and, and they they want to look a certain way. They want to dress a certain way. It's about their image, all of that stuff. And that's the sick side, the satanic side of really just gospel music, Christian music in general. Because after a while, we want to make sure we're getting paid. We want to make sure that we're getting booked for other tours that people want us to come. Because oftentimes in some of these in the Christian circles, you don't see the concerts taking place like you would see uh, a heavy metal concert or a rock concert or an R&B concert or anything like that. They're not usually booked in stadiums. Usually these artists are booked in churches. And so there, there needs to be this desire, this, this, this swelling of interest to have this person to come. And so if they see them, maybe their guest appearance with someone at a, at a performance, so they'll come to such and such church, that church, that church. The way that happens is someone needs to coordinate that, but they need to be seen. And so they'll go out there and oftentimes you think that these people were on a Hollywood red carpet. You would think that these people are, are, I don't know, going to the Grammys or going to the Emmys. I'm not, I can't remember which one is for music, but we got a problem, right? It, it should be that there's a, a, a clear line. I'm getting to the scriptures in a little bit, but there should be a clear line between what the world does and what we do. I'm not saying there's going to be, there won't be any similarities. Obviously there, there will be. But when you look like them, when you when you kind of grind and move like them, why come to church? I'm good with what I'm doing. I'll just read my Bible on my own. Right. And so what has happened is as they have tried to reach out and one, the, the, the bad thing about a lot of times in gospel music and it's the same thing in in contemporary Christian is one of the first things that seeps in is bad doctrine. Right now, I'm going to say something that might be a little bit controversial, um, but that's OK. Uh, I didn't write the Bible. I'm just simply saying what it says. And so this issue even of tongues comes up. And if a person believes in tongues, okay, fine. We won't argue that right now. But what about tongues when you're singing? I'll be honest, I've, I've never seen a verse and chorus sung in tongues and okay fine they believe in that well well okay well, who's interpreting that and, and i wonder if they put the words on the screen are they putting the tongues on the screen and i know I, i'm sounding silly and kind of uh, facetious but what are we doing here it's almost like we're trying to even compete when we're seeing the show who's the most godly who's the most spiritual who's the most whatever um it's it's as though when we sing people are instead of seeking him they're seeking their own and that's really what a lot of times a lot of music has kind of delved into gospel obviously uh, praise and worship contemporary praise and worship all of it it's, it's almost about uh what we want god give me some stuff right Give me some stuff, bless me, and then that's how I'm going to praise you. That's why I'm going to praise you. Well, that's an artificial cheap praise. It's conditional praise, right? God, do for me before I do for you. Forget the fact, God, that you've already done more than anyone can ever do or I can hope for anyone to do. Forget that. I need some more. What you did was not enough. And so, God, I need some things. And I promise you, Lord, if you're giving this, I'm going to praise you. So I'm going to shout. I'm going to do all these things that I should have been doing. And it teaches people who are also listening, because when a person comes to church and they hear that, they believe all of this is is, is approved by uh, the church leadership. And so if it's said in the choir and sang, then it must be, it passed through the hands of the pastor as well. One of the things that a wise pastor would do is to always make sure, always make sure that I see what you guys are singing. 
that we kind of coordinate this. I want to know what you're seeing and why. Because if you say something that's just out there, who's got to come back and fix that? Who's responsible for these people that are that are that are going amiss because you said something that was just really utterly unfounded and unbiblical? For example, there's a guy from my hometown of Indianapolis named Donald Lawrence. Got some good songs, but some of the songs just aren't necessarily biblical, right? And that happens a lot because people that sing, they're not necessarily theologians, they're not studying, although I think they probably should, because you're still up before the people ministering and they look at you. And so I think you ought to be doctrinally straight as well. But he has a song, uh, it's called "It's the, the Sound of My Breathing, and he takes the, the tetragrammaton, the, uh, the yad, hey, the, the Y-H-W-H that we have in English, and says that that means it's been kind of a, a, a thing for the last maybe 20 years. People have tried to say that that is uh, the unpronounced name of God, that those four letters are actually what the sound of breathing is. And that's God's name. And they make it into something really, really spiritual. Oh, my God. That's what that means. That's God's breathing. No, it's not. OK, uh, as someone who, who's Hebrew, I mean, who can speak Hebrew, as some Jewish person, is that the case? And they'll say, no, that's just silly. That's just Christians looking to be more than what we are. That's not what it means. Well, then having vowels. Well, here's the, here's the truth. Hebrew words, period, did, do not come with vowels, at least in the old. The Masoretic text um, added the vowels later. So people who, as they were taken into captivity and began to stop speaking Hebrew, when they tried to learn it, they were familiar, unfamiliar with the words. And so the Masoretes would put these vowel markings there so they could know what's saying. To come up with this goofy idea that it's, it's the sound of God speaking, I mean, I mean, of, of us breathing, that's just, not, that's, now you're making up something, okay? So what we want to do, though, as always, we want to go to the text and just be mindful. Listen, I got a few more things I want to say as well. And so let's go to, I hope I put it in the in the dark mode. Hope you guys can see this, but he says, uh, and, and Romans 14 16 says, so do not let what you regard as good be evil spoken of, or some verses may say, don't let your good be evil spoken of. And so the reason why that's important is if you're singing, if you're involved in something, it should not be an occasion uh, for an offense to be caused for someone to see something. Now, in this case, he's talking about if someone sees you eating meat and though eating meat is not sinful, don't do it in front of the people, right? Well, Nowadays, though, we're doing things that look to be sinful um, or questionable. Avoid those things. Um, my third oldest child, Hannah, she is, her job is a, is a praise and worship leader um, at a church for the youth. And we had a conversation before, and it was about just your appearance, right? <clears throat> now, she doesn't dress in, in, a, in a provocative way, but you've got youngsters there who might be looking at you. And you want to be mindful of that so that no young man, no older man will look at you uh, objectively as though you're something, some some piece of meat uh, that nothing that you do, that nothing that you wear takes away from the gospel. Right. Well, we see this a lot nowadays in churches. We see people who just have forgotten how to dress. Uh, and I know it's hard, ladies, I'm speaking ladies right now, but also guys, uh, I know it's hard to find clothes that just aren't, you know, tight and got your veins showing. I get that. But understand when you wear those things, I don't care how godly the guy is, uh, he's going to notice that. Right. And then some of the stuff that the men are wearing. Again, I was under a rock, maybe. But some of the things that the men are wearing, I mean, I, and maybe it's just me. I'm out of touch, I guess. I, you know, I'm still not down with the with the tight jeans and so forth. But even some of the things that let's say that like you saw the the Kirk Franklin's of the world wearing, it's like, what are, what are you wearing? What are you doing? What do you what do you have to prove? <laughs> you know, what I mean, OK, fine. You got a few dollars. You can buy something that's. Fashion, fashionably in, in, in vogue, whatever. But again, we want to have a holy appearance. Granted, we're not going back to uh, robes and to um, whatever they wore in, in, in the first century church time. I get that. But we don't also have to look like the world, like we're selling our bodies. Right. And so he says, don't let the good that you're doing um, be spoken of in an evil fashion. Then let's look at another passage that um, that Paul brings up. First Thessalonians 5, 22, am I there? He says, abstain from every form of evil. And guys, I promise you, 
Uh, I was trying to not bring up any Greek, but I will. This word form uh, is the word edus, which is just the outward appearance. So this is where some versions might say, avoid the very appearance of evil. So when you're singing, avoid the appearance of evil. Avoid it looking like it's about you and you're at some show, you're at some concert. Avoid that. It should That should not be the case. It should not be that uh, when we see you, we see all the lights. I don't have a problem with some of the lights. I do have a problem with the, uh, what do you call the pyrotechnics? I do have a problem with some of the illuminations that just make it, the smoke. I have a problem with that because now we're, we're what are we doing, y'all? We're, we're getting to where we're trying to entertain. And so now the attention is not on the word and what God is doing. The attention is on, man, these guys are jamming. These guys are getting down. These guys can really dance. Look at her. Look at him, right? And even to the point now where people are going to show off again their bodies up there. What's happening now, and it's not just, as I said, in just gospel, it's just in the black gospel circles, but it's also happening in the white churches, predominantly white churches. And it's sad that we even have these, these black church, white church, I know, but bear with me. But what's happening is in all the different churches and all the different denominations, obviously sin creeps in. And there are some people out there that are talented who have no business being in choirs, who have no business being in praise and worship. I've seen churches. By the way, do you know if if you have the talents here in Dallas, if you have the talent to play, let's say, an organ or piano or drums, uh, there are churches that will pay you to come in. Uh, let's say their piano player leaves or their organ, their organist, their whatever goes out of town. Well, God forbid, we got to have the music going. And so what do we do? We need to make sure that we got somebody in here. So we're going to pay somebody. And these guys make a good amount of money. Uh, you can make upwards between a thousand, depending on the size of the church, a thousand, two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars a week playing the organ, playing the piano in the Dallas area. Now, I don't know where it, what, it, what it's like in certain areas. Certain areas, church isn't as big. Right. But here in the Dallas area, in this in this area, you're going to have churches that listen. I don't want to give place to the devil when I say this. But it's true. Um, church has become, in many cases, big business. It's become something because, and I get it, every church, I remember times where we wanted to make sure, okay, well, what was the offering like? Not because we cared about it, but well, we got to pay some bills. We got to pay these things, these ministries, costs, and so forth. Uh, the gas for the van to go pick up people, that costs all the stuff it costs. Um, the electricity, uh, the electric company doesn't care that we love the Lord. They still want their money. Same thing with the gas company. So I get that. There is a a, a, a focus at, at some point in time on money. But sometimes we say we got to make sure that we keep folks coming in and entertain. That way, that way they'll give because a happy parishioner is a giving parishioner, right? And if we can entertain these people and make them feel blessed. Because what's one thing that we do sometimes and and some of you folks that may have been to a predominantly black church or a charismatic church, what have you, a Baptist or a traditional Baptist church, when the music is going, we'll say, ooh, child, didn't we have church? We don't know what was preached. We don't know what the topic was, but ooh, we enjoyed the Lord today. We had church, right? And so that shouldn't be. It should be that we went and received a word from the Lord that could develop us and keep us going throughout the week, right? And so in churches today, as I said, the world creeps in. One of the biggest problems, I thought it was just in the black church, but no, it's in the white church, in the choirs, issues of sexuality. First of all, I don't know how many affairs have happened in church choirs. Don't know, uh, but a lot. Whether it's a big church, whether it's a small church, it happens a lot. You've got men that see women who may be there for a legitimate reason, but they've got issues. They've got pain. Some guy did them wrong. And so while they may be vulnerable, this wolf sees um this fox over there and uh, his tongue gets to hanging out and he gets to salivate and he sees somebody and uh, look here, sis, I understand what you've been going through and, and you know me too. Good. Can, can, can we pray together sometime? You know, uh, here's my address. Here's my number, right? That happens. Uh, these relationships being exchanged, it happens. You've got one of the things that we used to always talk about was how uh, the piano player or the organ in the church, organist in the church was gay. A lot of homosexuality um, showing up rearing its head in church choirs, church praise and worship teams because they, they're they gifted too. Um, and, and there's a lot of gay guys that can sing and he can sing and he can play. And so let's get him in here. Uh, let's get him on. And here's, here was one of the things that happened. Let's get him in here, let him play, and then we'll see if we can convert him later because 
Pastor, my God, he can't he can't hear the gospel outside and, and, and let him come in and play. Well, guess what? That'll allow him to hear the gospel and, and to convert him, right? No, we're not. No, the standard is going to be the standard. The standard is up here. We're not going to lower it because somebody can play or somebody can sing. So the issue that we're having over and over again is that we are trading in actual worship for a fake worship, for a plastic uh, lighting and smoking worship that sounds good, that tickles the ear. But wouldn't it be sad? Wouldn't it be sad to hear good music? And let me, let's, let's call it what it is. It's good music. Now, it's not necessarily delivering music. But let's say we hear all this good music and maybe we hear, hear words and we're entertained and, and, and to go to church and to enjoy yourself in church and still go to hell. How bad would that be?